So uh, I'm, I'm not going to provoke you now at this point. Um, so I will not ask you, you know, whether somebody's been depressed or not. Obviously, I've been. I'm talking out of my own experience. Uh, it's not something that is really nice. Uh, but uh, basically, I don't have a PowerPoint. I, I wanted to make this as personal as possible. So you have to look at me or maybe at your mobile phone or something like that if you wish. But still, the, the first slide on my deck says depression is a friend. And let's leave it at that. And I'll explain later on why depression can be a friend, why I treat it as a friend. Uh, first of all, we have to acknowledge that uh, depression is a terrifying disease. It's really terrifying. And to make it more personal, I'll tell you about a friend who died in January. He um, fell off, basically he jumped off Peracica Bridge. Um, I guess most of people here in the hall know where it is. Those who don't, you can ask somebody. It's somewhere on the highway in uh, the northern region in Gorinska. And I didn't know about this, that, that this happened until I saw the obituary in the main Slovenian newspaper after the fact, even after the funeral. And it said there, there was the name, Alesh something. It doesn't matter who the person is. I knew the person well, and uh, I phoned up his colleague from the job. And I said, Petra, tell me what happened. And she said, I'm not sure I can tell you. I said, Petra, come on. First of all, is this Alesh that we both know and knew and cherished? She said, yes, this is the guy. So what was wrong? Well, you know, I said, was it suicide? She said, yeah, it was suicide. I mean, obviously it was suicide, but why? I said, Petra, look, if it's easier for you, let me tell you I've been fighting with depression. Oh, really? Okay, then I, I can tell you. So basically, depression in this sense acted as a sort of a key to unlocking information that is stigmatized, something behind a closed door, something we don't talk about, almost as inaccessible as, I don't know, some other stigma. Uh, let me not go too dark on that. Um, when you talk to your friends about depression, you start hearing stories, many stories. Basically, 80% of, sui of suicides, uh, that's an estimate, are um, caused by depression. So why does this happen? Let me bring the brighter side of the depression. I will go to the point why. Why you think about suicide. Some of the great achievers in history have been fighting with depression. They've been known to have been depressives. Uh, the list here is, my list is short, but it's much longer when you go to Wikipedia or something like that. And uh, some people who really stand out are uh, Winston Churchill. Um, I was surprised I read his biography. I didn't know he won the Nobel Prize in literature after his political career, so when he lost the premiership. Uh, so being the Prime Minister. Abraham Lincoln, uh, Marcel Proust, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, the famous physicist, and many others. So about me. I've had eight episodes in 20 years. I'm 44 now. Uh, my first episode that I recognized that I've had it was at about 24, and I didn't know what it was at first. I, I didn't recognize it. I remembered later on that when I studied, there were periods when my study was slower, that I couldn't you know, grasp things together as good as I could at certain other times. But the level of how all the symptoms came together, I, I can claim that my first episode was uh, 20 years ago. So eight in 20 gives you about you know, episodes in every, what, two and a half, two and a half years. So my, my last episode started in September 2015, so a year and a half ago, and it lasted until February, but I was not good until August last year. Uh, now I'm okay, 
although afraid that, that the next one is approaching. So for the first time in my life, after eight episodes, I stopped considering depression something that I will beat. I consider it as something that I will have to learn to live with. I've gone to psychotherapy, I've gone to psychiatrists, I've taken Zoloft, Ciprexa, Wellbutrin, if, if that means something to any of you, and I've never been hospitalized, luckily. I, I know many people who've been hospitalized. Also, what I've experienced is that you go through periods of highs and lows. So, uh, sometimes I thought I was bipolar. Um, I wouldn't consider myself bipolar at this point. But, you know, going from depression to bipolar to schizophrenia and to some other states is a sort of um, continuum. It's hard to say this is this bracket, this is this bracket, this is the next bracket. Sometimes that's hard to say. I think I've, I'm actually lucky enough to be in periods where my depression is light enough. This means that I'm not hindered from working, although my working capacity effectiveness is, is lowered. Uh, so, um, what happens in, um, in a depression? I'll say in a minute. But before that, why am I talking here right now? It's my first talk about, about my depression. My first post about depression, I think I put it on my blog uh, about uh, three months ago, something like that. I've been hinting about it already before. But you know, from my first episode when I didn't know what it is myself, and then telling my wife about it, and telling my kids about it, these are my two kids, Max Ula. Uh, so basically, it was, a, basic, it was a, a period of opening up. First, you talk to, to, to your wife. Then you talk to a few friends. Then later, you talk to your parents. That's, very, that's a hard one. And um, finally, you come to a stage where you tell it to your boss. You offer your resignation, which I did. I said, look, I cannot run this project at this level. That was a, a certain event I was organizing. And please, I need help. And uh, if you think I'm not uh, good enough for this, I'll just hand, hand in my resignation. And he said, no, don't worry. So basically, the company supported me at that time. Now, even if I apply to a job, I say, I can do this, this, this. Ah, my background a little bit, so why I'm at this conference, I'm not a coder. Um, I have a few very, very good friends here, even in this room. Uh, but I've been in the creative industries. I, I'm a physicist by uh, my first, uh, let's see, graduate diploma. But later on, I worked in uh, creative industries like uh, advertising, uh, then had my startup, a copy of Net Netflix. So there I had my, my spout of internet businesses. Uh, very up and down. And then worked in uh, IT companies. And now I'm in uh, pharmaceuticals, not for the antidepressants. <laughs> I've, I've had, actually, I've had really few uh, um, therapies with, with pills. I don't like pills. Okay? So. <clears throat> Why is depression a friend? I think uh, depression, some people say that already 20% of population is somehow affected, but 20% of population, hidden very much, okay? Not talked about. Definitely not something that we should boast about. I'm not boasting about it, not at all. But let me go to how I understand my depression. Um, I understand my mind is a kind of a furnace. It burns, so that, therefore the burnout. So why does the burnout happen? Uh, in um, hundreds of years ago, in our evolutionary history, the capacity of body was very important. 
the body as a whole. Today, we, we, our society uh, has made all these advances, or most of them, due to our cognition. So basically, if we were more centered in our body before, like some, I don't know, societies in Africa, you know, with all the rhythm, etc. Now we're very much into coding here, towards the head, into the computer, in front of a screen. That's what we do. So what's the problem with that? Our brain is about one, perhaps one half, two percent of body weight. The level of energy it burns is 10 times that, so about 20 percent sometimes even 25%. Now imagine that your brain is not, is not balanced in terms of how it consumes energy, that sometimes it's taking on too much. This means that it leaves too little inside the other parts of the body. And then the body as a nat natural mechanism starts fighting back. So, um, when I fall in a depression, I still go to job, uh, function, barely function. Um, I cannot shake it off. Some people say, ah, cheer up. Ah, let's go to a, to a nice spot. Let's go to, for good food, etc." But I cannot shake it off in a day or two days or in a week. So what heals me is time. I just need time. And of course, time is also provided for by the network of people who support you. That my family is my first provider of time. My friends are my providers of time. My financial security is my provider of time. So, um, what does the body do? The body says to the brain, your thoughts and ideas will not go as fast as they did before you start not remembering stuff, forgetting stuff, your thoughts become slower. The speech becomes dry. Sometimes in a depression I think I cannot speak English anymore. Even Slovenian. Even complete phrases are not coming out anymore. It's hard to put together a letter, one letter, one page of consistent text. It's hard to do that. Um, decisions are particularly tough. It's very hard to decide. Sometimes very, very profane stuff like shall I, shall, I, shall I go for a pizza or shall I go for a normal lunch somewhere? I mean, it sounds profane, but imagine that most of the decisions are not that easy. But simple decisions become hard. And what, what is very annoying is the anxiety, this fear inside of yourself. That you will embarrass yourself, that something will go wrong, that you will fail something. So what happens after that is a self-depreciation vicious cycle. You only see failure everywhere. You say, I'm a failure, I'm a total failure. I'm a burden to my family, to my society, to people around me. You lack energy. You feel like you're a log somewhere. So not a living being, but a log lying on a bed on the ground. It doesn't matter where. But you feel sleepy. You feel lethargic, so the antipode of energetic. And you fear encounters. You don't fear meeting people per se, but every meeting of people, even a phone conversation, can bring up challenging discussion, and you fear that. Because you don't feel you can stand up to that. And as I said, you cannot just shake it off. Um, so what happens after a certain time passes? So somehow, you are broken, you are down. Suddenly, the body lets go, in a way, and all those shattered pieces of your personality, you reconstruct them in a new way. 
in a way, I feel as if I was a phoenix every time I rise out of the ashes of my depression. And um, it's in a way glorifying and satisfying, although the price I had to pay for that was, was a big one. And in those moments, when I come together from those shattered pieces, some of the work I produced is, is the best. Because I'm, I'm new, in a way. <clears throat> so why does the burnout happen? Uh, it doesn't happen because of the depression. It happens because of the highs. So it happens because when I'm good, I want to be even better and I burn more and more and more. And I try to fight off the periodic lack of energy or day-to-day -day stress with putting, it, putting in even more tasks into my cognitive engine. And that's a problem. So basically depression protects you from a complete burnout. Depression in a way protects you from, you know, the Japanese syndrome of, you know, death from burnout. Um, I guess uh, it protects me from, I guess, I just guess. It protects me from some other type of failure. So if you don't carry around a depression, I don't know, perhaps you will grow a tumor instead. I'm sarcastic. So how do I protect myself? Um, I think the most important thing is that even when I feel like a zero, I'm still the one to somebody. Even when I feel like I'm a zero, which means going into thoughts of non-existence. Let me not talk about suicide. I didn't have too many problems about that, so I, I have a mild, mild periods of depression. So lower productivity, anxiety, fear, etc. So I'm not a kind of a very uh, harsh situations that people also experience. I don't know, perhaps it's my role to speak about that, therefore. So we, even if I feel like a zero, I'm still just being present. I am somebody. To these two people here, to my wife, to my friends, I don't have to do anything. I just have to be present. Okay? And um, to protect yourself, it's also good to be aware there were successes. Even if at the times of depression you only see failures. You say, you fail this, you fail this, you fail this. Please be aware there were successes. Even if your mind doesn't let you recall them every instant because you feel very insecure at those times. Um, also protection, exercise. Um, I didn't realize for a long time until a, a friend said to me, Gregor, were you a sportist when you were young? I said, yes, I was training every day, uh, ballroom dancing. So I was a colleague of Andrej Kufca, Katerina Venturini and some other dancers and going to, to world championships even to dance with my wife. So there was a lot of, you know, training, physical activity. And for a certain time when I was working, after, after I finished dancing, I stopped that. So today I run two times a week. I do Tibetan exercises in the morning, every morning. Uh, I go to the mountains every Friday. So if somebody wants to join, Yesterday I was on, uh, at Koroshica. I have nice pictures, but just not on the slides today, okay? 
I, I think it's good to be open and to be humble, to listen to people. So why this talk? It's my first talk, as I said. It helps me. So it's egoistic in a way, but I also know it helps others. I'm not saying that it helps you here, but perhaps it helps one person here. And that's enough. Thank you very much. Okay, the, the, I was given the task to repeat the question. How would we design workplaces to, to account for that? Um, I have one thing in my mind, slowness. So uh, we, we consider in our society that going faster is the way to create value. But often going faster actually takes away the value. Now it's a matter of the, this 3P principle, which is not just profits, but also people's, people and planet. So if you create prop, profit at the cost of your people in any, any way, also putting them to burnout, then perhaps you're not a sustainable business. I like the way um, Bank and Olofsson in their philosophy says, we don't have deadlines because we create wonderful products. This means that when you start designing a new Bank and Olofsson, they don't start with a ah, deadline is August. They say, no, we will accomplish this. Of course, you have to have discipline to accomplish. But it's not the, the, the deadline mentality that is driving the value. Yes, um, so what is the root cause of a depression? Um, I don't uh, believe in causality, personally. So this is, this is a longer discussion. But I don't believe that things go like from because of A, B happened and then C happened. I think it's a combination of many things, contextual and there are root causes, I believe. Uh, my, one of my root causes is of course, physical, one is physical. The other thing is that uh, in certain times I, I was extremely ambitious. Like having the idea, when you are good, you believe that you can accomplish, I mean, move mountains and then, then you do all sorts of stuff and, and burn out because you think you will move those mountains. Eventually they will move, but not necessarily just because you made the move. Perhaps that's close to, uh, to what you asked.